Hello and welcome. You're watching Profit Insights on NDTV Profit. I'm your host Pallavi Nahata, and we're doing a special to discuss uh, the. CPI inflation and IIP figures. Uh, the figures have come out with a little bit of a delay. Uh, they, they're a little later uh, than the usual time. Uh, but nevertheless, a good set of figures, India's retail inflation has come in at 4.85% for March. That's compared to 5.1% in January and February. Uh, it's also pretty much in line with expectations. Uh, a Bloomberg poll had estimated the figure to come in at about 4.9%. Food and beverage inflation, which we've been watching out for closely, has come in at 7.68%, not as much of a change from the previous figure, which was at 7.8%. What has changed is fuel inflation, that's uh, come in at minus 3.24% for March compared to minus 0.8% the previous month. Looking at some of the internal, cereal prices came in at 8.4%, a little higher than the previous month. Inflation in meat and fish was also a tad higher. Uh, inflation in milk uh, was at 3.4%. Prices of oils and fats continued to decline. Vegetable prices, importantly, rose 28.3%. That's compared to a rise of 30.3% that we saw the previous month. Pulses. Uh, east a little bit but continued to remain elevated at 17.7%. Clothing and footwear came in at 3%, whereas housing inflation came in at 2.8%. 2 2 uh, the figures for IIP have also come in and for February, IIP grew by 5.7%. Now, to discuss these figures in a little more detail, I'm joined by DK Joshi, the Chief Economist at Crystal, and Anubhuti Sahai from Standard Chartered. Thank you so very much to both of you for taking time out. Uh, uh, Mr. Joshi, I'll start with you. What have you made of the figures? Uh, broadly in line with expectations, but from what I understand, we did expect a little bit of easing in food inflation as well, at least on an annual basis. That does not seem to have been the case with most of the relief coming in from fuel. That's right. I think the, uh, the food inflation continues to be a bugbear, and within that, the vegetables are a problem because typically vegetables have a short crop cycle. They keep going up and down. But this time, I think uh, they have faced multidimensional shocks. I mean, whether it was uh, rain, sometimes shortage, sometimes excess, or the heat, I think all that has led to, uh, uh, to, to lower arrivals for, for many of the vegetables in the market. So we did this time, I think the vegetable prices uh, haven't seen uh, uh, the kind of cycles they see in winter. They typically come down, but they didn't come down that much uh, this time around. And I think that's a lot to do with the to the to a lot to do with the weather. So clearly, I think uh, that's one one aspect: uh, the the persistence of high vegetable inflation. Second thing I notice is that. The non-vegetarian stuff is becoming somewhat uh, more expensive or the inflation is rising somewhat faster. Particularly if you look at eggs, uh, I think the uh, there's data is not there for broilers, etc. But the, the market information uh, tells you that their prices are also rising. Uh, look, I think uh, uh, overall on inflation on expected lines, uh, uh, non-food is not a worry at all. Worry is the food food inflation, which has been persistently high, and I think for that, uh, uh, what happens to monsoons next year will uh, largely determine how uh, how much the food inflation comes down. And right now, I think the signals are positive on that because uh, the the uh, El Nino is expected to be replaced by La Nina, so that should lead to abundant rains and uh, hopefully uh, uh, relief on vegetable inflation and that is we also have a forecast of 4.5 for next year and that is premised on this assumption iip was expected to do well i think the data was uh, auto data particularly was very strong and uh, uh, also the pmis uh, were extremely strong for uh, for the month of february and for month of march they've gone up even more so which probably in hints said that the even the March uh, data for uh, industrial production will be quite strong. 
So this is good. I mean, uh, inflation growth dynamics are turning a little, little more favorable. I would say. Okay. All right. Uh, Anubhuti, what are your uh, thoughts on the inflation data? It, uh, you know, while the figure is broadly in line with expectations uh, and has eased from what we saw uh, in the previous months, uh, food prices continue to remain fairly sticky. And as Mr. Joshi pointed out, uh, the some of the headwinds to uh, vegetable prices remain. So, uh, how are you viewing this data? And uh, what about the concerns going ahead? We're already, uh, we've already been cautioned about heat waves in the next few months. Is there a chance that we're looking at food prices continuing to remain sticky, food inflation uh, continuing to see any durable easing over the next few months? What are you making of these figures? Yeah, sure. So I think on uh, uh, when we are looking at the risk, as you very clearly mentioned and uh, what uh, uh, DK also mentioned, uh, food inflation clearly remains a risk because there are forecasts of heat waves. Uh, right now, monsoons are expected to be normal, but uh, it's equally important to keep an eye on how they are distributed and, and the intertemporal distribution uh, will be extremely important to keep an eye on. Uh, already, the government has uh, released uh, the production data for wheat and it is are lower uh, than what uh, was anticipated uh, earlier. So I think on food uh, prices, the concerns will remain uh, going uh, forward. And the same uh, rhetoric uh, was uh, flagged uh, during the recent uh, MPC, uh, you know, in the MPC statement as well as the MPC press conference. Having said that, uh, given that core inflation is extremely low, if you look at the core inflation numbers uh, for March, it's down at down to 3.26 percent. I mean, we have not seen such low core inflation in this uh, CPI uh, series, and this is the fourth uh, successive month when core CPI is below uh, 4 percent. Uh, so, while food prices are high uh, and is a concern, low core inflation, low fuel and light inflation is you know have the uh, um, you know, uh, they have more than enough firepower to offset the impact for from food uh, inflation uh, going forward. So our sense is that a below 5% headline CPI print, which we have seen, is likely to continue uh, going uh, forward. Uh, the first uh, quarter of uh, FY25, that is uh, the quarter of June 24, we do expect uh, CPI to average at 4.9% because on core, we are not seeing too much of a, a price pressure building up anytime uh, soon. While I mean, there are some uh, concerns about uh, crude oil prices globally, but that doesn't impact or hit the headline CPI number immediately. Uh, so I think uh, yeah, uh, food inflation is a concern, vegetable inflation is a concern, cereals inflation is a concern, and so are pulses inflation. But given that core inflation is low and fuel inflation is in the negative territory, I think from a headline perspective, we can expect a headline number to remain uh, closer to 4.5%. In fact, in the second quarter, it's likely to dip below uh, 4%. That theme should uh, uh, boost uh, uh, the MPC to go ahead and uh, deliver rate cuts uh, eventually in uh, fiscal year uh, 25. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, it's something we've been scratching our head over, but Mr. Joshi, what do you think uh, continues to explain the deacceleration we continue to see in core inflation? Well, core inflation is a, uh, uh, is, is a very uh, peculiar phenomenon. I think overall, if you look at the overall growth in the system, that's very strong. Uh, but within that, uh, the consumption demand is uh, weaker. So I think the consumption demand pressure on, uh, on on core inflation would be lower. And other thing to keep in mind is that even the input costs had come down. So that results in uh, uh, lower pressure for uh, for uh, for uh, for companies to uh, to they can absorb uh, they they take some benefit from lower input costs and they also pass it on to the end consumer. I think both seem to be happening. Uh, at this juncture. So I would say somewhat weaker consumption demand and lower input costs. Probably I think that's uh, that's one way to look at uh, the low uh, core, in, uh, core inflation prevailing right now. 
Okay, all right. Uh, Anubhuti, coming back to you, uh, and we'll shift focus uh, first to some of the elements that Mr. Joshi brought about. Uh, in recent weeks, we have seen a fairly consistent rise across several commodities, food and metal. Uh, can we expect some of that to start reflecting in WPI in the coming months? And uh, how does sort of that change the outlook going forward, considering that a low WPI inflation uh, has continued to benefit uh, margins of companies and reflected uh, in, you know, in, in the economy as well. How's that going to change? Uh, will it have a considerable change in the coming months? Or is at this point, is that not so much a concern? I think it's still too early, uh, um, you know, to draw very firm uh, conclusions. Uh, you are right that uh, most of the commodities have seen a rally in their prices. Uh, the imp and to that extent, when it comes to monthly WPI, we will see an uptick. Uh, but um, uh, I mean, um, I mean, the WPI numbers are really low. Uh, you know, like zero percent, one percent. So um, the uptick might might not be. Uh, very uh, sharp and the transmission from WPI to CPI is usually very uh, lagged. Uh, even if uh, some of the commodity prices uh, shoot up, uh, corporates would like to see sustainability of these price levels before passing it on to the consumer. So there will be a significant uh, lag, uh, um, um, you know, of these commodity price increases being transferred from WPI uh, to CPI. Um, having said that, I think when you are talking about core inflation, as I highlighted the previously, this is the fourth print which is below 4%. And uh, at 3.26%, it's a really low, low number. Um, the key question is, are we going to sustain at these levels of core inflation uh, going forward? And uh, our sense is that's unlikely to be the case. Our view is that by end of March 2025, so almost a year ahead from now, uh, as consumer demand picks up, especially rural demand picks up on normal monsoon, as commodity price effects, uh, we are looking for crude oil prices above $90 uh, over the next uh, 12 months and possibly some uptick in, even in uh, other commodity space. You know, as lower commodity prices uh, impact fades away, we do expect that core inflation would move back towards its long medium term average of, uh, you know, like 5%. So, uh, for now, uh, core inflation is likely to remain low. For the year as a whole, it's likely to average at around 4.2%. But we really don't see this uh, as a sustainable, uh, or we don't see this as an equilibrium. As consumer demand picks up and the impact of low commodity prices fades away, we would see core inflation uh, picking up. Okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, that's uh, most interesting. We are truly going to be watching out on how core inflation pans out. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Shoshi, I do also want to ask you about fuel. And this time around, of course, uh, fuel inflation has seen a dip. We have seen the government cut petrol and diesel prices, as well as LPG prices, and it's probably that uh, showing up in fuel inflation. But uh, at the same time, at this point, we're seeing elevated crude oil prices. Uh, so both from a WPI as well as a CPI perspective, as well as from the perspective of uh, an economy uh, which continues to remain largely dependent on crude prices, uh, what are, how are you looking at crude prices? At this point, do you think it's too early to say if there will be an impact uh, or uh, is it already a cause of some concern, even if not so much? Well, uh, rising crude prices always uh, 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 raise a lot of uh, uh, concern. I mean, because uh, we are, as you rightly said, we are dependent on oil imports. I think they, if they go up and stay high, uh, then I think they have impact on deficit, both fiscal and current account. They also have impact on inflation, and they are also known to to bring GDP down. But I think it's it's too early to say that whether that will happen or not. That depends on how much oil prices rise and whether they stay there uh, persistently. I mean, if it's a transitory phenomena, uh, then I think uh, the impact can be easily absorbed. So I think uh, the real worry on oil starts when it uh, when it touches 100 and stays there. I think that is that really starts biting.
So, uh, Anubhuti, I'll start with you this time. Uh, you know, given we've just seen the US CPI numbers come in, uh, while India CPI numbers are broadly on expected lines, US CPI was higher than was expected, pretty much ruling out a rate cut by the Fed in June. What does that mean for India's MPC? So given the uh, very strong set of data coming out of US, uh, whether we look at the employment number or the CPI number, which you just uh, mentioned, uh, there is a significant uh, reduction in expectation of rate cuts from the uh, Fed. Uh, so, for instance, initially we were expecting 100 basis points of rate cuts in 2024, starting June. Uh, now we expect only 50 basis points uh, starting uh, July. Uh, but, of course, the number of meetings in which they will be cutting uh, has been uh, reduced from four meetings to just uh, two and just two rate cuts. Now, this clearly has an impact on... Uh, uh, the uh, timing of uh, rate cuts uh, in India, while MPC has never would you know wouldn't like to uh, acknowledge it explicitly, but for any uh, central bank, especially EM central banks, uh, to cut ahead of uh, uh, Fed would become uh, slightly challenging, even if the backdrop uh, in, in you know in their own economy remains pretty favorable. So in case of India, we are looking at. The inflation numbers, they are extremely favorable and support a rate cut. Uh, but if Fed is not cutting its rates before uh, July, and on top of it, uh, given that India's growth story is also extremely uh, solid at this particular point in time, our sense is that the first rate cut from uh, uh, India NPC is likely uh, to happen only by October of 2024, uh, not before that. By then, they will have a very good clarity on monsoons and the stickiness around food inflation, which we have all been bothered about uh, for past several months. So that's the time when we think they would be uh, starting the rate cut in India. But the rate cuts in India are likely to be extremely shallow in our view because uh, the 4% medium-term target uh, on headline CPI is unlikely to be uh, met. And uh, uh, our view is that 4.5% CPI in fiscal year 25 is uh, uh, unlikely to be sustained uh, going forward into FY26. And if the real rate uh, of 1%, uh, if we use that uh, metric of real rate of 1%, then our sense is that uh, repo rate uh, would just come down by 50 basis uh, points between October and December. Uh, and, uh, you know, not more than that. But Fed uh, uh, data in U.S. and Fed, uh, 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 you know, delays in the Fed rate cut uh, impacts the timing, not the quantum of rate cuts uh, in India. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Joshi, I do want to shift focus to uh, the IIP figures now. Uh, we've seen manufacturing come in at about 5%, electricity at 7.5%, uh, and mining at 8%. Uh, you, you did touch upon uh, how solid some of the uh, indicators, macro indicators, have been so far. Can we expect the momentum we're seeing for this month in IIP uh, to continue? Yeah, I would say it will, I mean, at least as far as we can see, uh, the power demand will stay strong, particularly because the heat uh, 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 waves will mean that more power consumption, uh, more air conditioning would be required. So I think, uh, uh, and, 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 and since uh, uh, manufacturing is, uh, or industrial production is doing in general well, you'll require more power. So that is, uh, that is more or less, I think, uh, our base case uh, for, for power demand. And then infrastructure spend from the government is 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 continuing, so that will also power part of the uh, part of the uh, the uh, the pickup in IIP. Uh, but IIP in itself is somewhat volatile in terms of year-on-year -year numbers. So, uh, but I would I mean we are pricing in or we are factoring in healthy growth in industrial production in the in the coming fiscal as well. Uh, for March, we expect uh, 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 the IIP to remain pretty strong. Uh, five, around 5 to 6%. Okay, all right. And uh, looking at some of the sectors as well, uh, while uh, primary goods uh, is at 5.9%, capital goods is at 1.2%, intermediate goods at 9.5%, infrastructure 8.5%, consumer durables at 12.3%, and consumer non-durables at a contraction of 3.8%. Anubhuti, uh, 
capital goods and consumer non durables uh, anything more to read there uh, you know given that uh, both are on the lower side and consumer non durables has seen a contraction uh, does that sort of say anything to you about demand or uh, you know given the volatility we sometimes tend to see in iip uh, it's sort of hard to say anything at this stage How, what are you making of these figures Yes, I think consumer non-durable uh, uh, echoes uh, the broader sentiment uh, pretty well, which is of weak uh, rural demand, and especially if you look at the commentaries coming from most of the FMCG segment, uh, weak uh, weak consumer non-durable doesn't come as a as a surprise. Um, in terms of uh, you know like contraction of minus 3.8 percent in Feb versus say I think uh, minus 0.2 percent in the previous uh, month. Uh, that that remains volatile and that's very difficult to so you know that there is some bit of volatility but in terms of broader narrative i think it pretty much echoes uh, the narrative which we all have been hearing which is weak rural demand weak demand uh, especially for, for fmcg uh, products uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know like capital goods i think capital goods rather than just looking at uh, the um, monthly numbers it's equally important to uh, keep an eye on how they have performed uh, since uh, uh, you know uh, over the uh, fiscal as a whole and that has been closer to 6 and a half percent uh, last year the growth was extremely strong and was going into double digits so there is some bit of a, a base effect playing in plus as we move into the election phase uh, april 19 the election starts there will be a you know some loss in momentum uh, when it comes to capex or uh, capex either by the government or by the private sector and that can weigh down on the capital goods uh, number but uh, overall uh, i think uh, the mix is pretty clear uh, that is the public capex is uh, clearly uh, taking a lead urban demand is clearly taking a lead over uh, rural uh, demand uh, i think uh, when you are looking at gdp uh, iip is important and completely agree here that uh, probably we will see march quarter iip closer to 5% but uh, from gdp perspective what will play a much bigger role is the uh, earnings uh, report of india inc uh, because that is uh, that plays a much larger role in uh, deciding the manufacturing gva and there are already a lot of uh, you know uh, reports uh, as well as some of the uh, that there would be a Uh, deceleration uh, in uh, or you know or slow down in the earnings uh, growth uh, in march quarter versus uh, december quarter so i think that will uh, slow down the headline gdp uh, for uh, quarter 4 um, a lot and i mean as per the um, uh, must be or uh, must be second advance estimate they are indicating 5.9% it can be slightly better but yeah we will be definitely down from 8% kind of a gdp growth which we saw in the uh third quarter of fiscal year 24 okay all right uh with that we're almost completely out of time but uh, mr joshi before we can leave you uh, a quick wrap up of today's figures and what it means for in terms of the broader economy today's figures also pretty much reinforce the continuing uh, economic momentum we're seeing in the economy uh, would that be sort of the correct way to look at it Yeah I think it is uh, it is indicating a strong growth momentum I think you also have to look at other numbers uh, tax collections were extremely strong uh, the PMIs are uh, at hist- almost historically high levels so all that is uh, is telling you that the momentum has very much continued uh, uh, in the into the last quarter of uh, this fiscal year and there is chance that uh, the 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 uh, the gdp for the full fiscal year could be somewhat higher for 23 24 than what was predicted so very solid momentum as of now okay all right and with that we're completely out of time but thank you so much for watching stay tuned for more on ndtv profit thank you so much mr joshi and adubuti for taking time out for us today